How's it going, everybody? Thanks for hanging around for the next speech. I know it can be hard sometimes, but that was a brilliant speech for Connor. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, a bit more about the benefits of uh, BIM uh, for a mechanical and electrical subcontractor. Uh, I'd like to start by saying thanks a million to all the lads at Sligo IT, Rory, Trevor, Pat, for organising this. And I think it's very heartening to see the passion that they have. They're not just guys that say, come to the lecture halls and talk. A couple of months ago, the lads had the helmets and the high visits on. They were coming in, looking around the building sites. They came down to our head office in Carrick and Shannon, had a look at all the technology, the software we're using, and uh, they just had a real genuine interest. And Trevor sits on the Northwest BIM region committee as well. So it's great to see the, the genuine interest that they have in the construction industry and all the technology and the new technology that's around it. And before I get into the presentation, I just want to say I was at a, I had a stand in the RDS show where the students all came in earlier this year and I'd set up things like an interactive smart screen, virtual reality headset, robotic total stations and uh, I, people seem to have a think that the construction industry is this dirty, messy industry. And just to let everyone here know, like it's, it is changing drastically. So it's, I think it's a great choice. Uh, I have about 14 years experience in the construction industry. And uh, I went back to college for a second time in 2016 and did a H-dip in BIM. Um, I successfully completed a number of BIM level two projects in Ireland and the UK. I uh, have about 14 years of experience using AutoCAD and about five or six years experience in the BIM and I've also completed courses in other electrical design software. A couple of the benefits that we really see from building information modeling and the technologies in the industry are impressing existing clients, coordination with other contractors, clash detection, uh, visualization, the quality of information and the drawings that you can get as a result of using BIM, uh, accurate ordering of materials, off-site fabrication that Connor discussed in great detail there, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about that. Uh, the laser scanning and the robotic total stations. So I'm just going to give a recent example of how we used BIM to make a, give our client a better experience with the company. Uh, they were an existing client and we worked with them for decades and they kept us busy from 2007 onwards where the recession came and there wasn't a lot of work happening. They had loads of ongoing work, so they were very good to us in these times. Uh, they were building a brand new extension at one of their facilities in the UK and we were responsible for the mechanical and the electrical installation. Uh, they didn't know what BIM was. BIM wasn't a requirement on the project. No one, no one really knew anything about it. We hadn't inc included our costed BIM into the project, but we thought it would benefit the project and benefit ourselves doing the install and also impress the client while we were doing it. Uh, we chose to use BIM because there was a very tight deadline on the project. There was a couple of tricky areas uh, and we were responsible for the mechanical and the electrical install. Previous to this, we would have been doing a lot of jobs where we would have been mainly doing the electrical but last year we have a full mechanical division uh, incorporated into the company. Now we have four offices in the UK, one in Germany, and one our main office in Ireland, which is in Carrick and Shannon. <clears throat> so an example of the tricky area was there was a screed being poured over our services supports uh, on the first floor, which all of our services were going to be suspended underneath this slab and the screed that was going to be poured. So it's something that had to be got right the first time. Uh, there was an awful lot of structural steel also, and the, the seal and void area over the ground floor was very tight. So the steps required to turn it into a BIM project. We generated an architect's model from 2D AutoCAD plans and sections. So we, we don't claim to be architects, but the floors and the ceilings, everything and the seal and voids, everything was accurate in the model. So we were able to start building from there. Uh, we requested a structural steel model, so we find that they're available on 90% of the projects we'd be working on. Uh, and the structural steel people tend to use things like Tecla for doing all their calculations, all their prefabrications, and they can generally share a, an IFC model. 
So that can be linked into Revit, which is the Autodesk software that we use for BIM. Uh, we got the plans and sections off the refrigeration contractor and we generated a rough model of their units. Um, these were going located on the first floor and where the pipes are going down, that's into the void over the ground floor. We also had to do uh, electrical drops and power drops to some of the ground floor equipment and conveyor belts. So we generated a 3D model of that from, again, AutoCAD 2D plans and sections. Uh, we generated a clash-free electrical model. We generated a clash-free mechanical model. And when we had this done and everything was co coordinated, we'd, we went about generating a full model of our hangers, which is our unistruts and threaded rods. And these were going to support things like the pipe runs, uh, the electrical containment, and compressed air pipe work, and other services like that. So when it was all brought together, it looked something like this. And this was all sitting within the overall model, which has included the structural and the architect's model. So another thing that's very useful is the level of detail you can get out of your drawings and your models once you've built them. On the left-hand side, the information that's tagged on that drawing, that's automatically tagged. It's literally just a matter of clicking on the containment and you all of a sudden have this information spat out, like the width, the length, and the height from the finished floor level. Uh, something that you'd spend quite a lot of time trying to detail up in the 2D way of, traditional way of doing it using AutoCAD. And on the right hand side, the estimators and the quantity surveyors love to see this kind of thing. The, it basically gives you down to the millimeter of every type of containment, our light fitting, our ductwork, whatever you need, automatically thrown out in a schedule. It's live linked all inside in the model. Uh, up until this project that we did in the UK, our site team would never have seen a drawing like this. Uh, it's basically a separate drawing that only showed the hanger positions. Before the, that we had to put into position before the screed was poured on the floor. So the T's and the number beside them stands for the threaded rods, the U stands for the uni struts, and a schedule automatically built in Revit would tell them something like they needed 270 uni struts cut at 1,000, well, 1,500 mil. Also that they needed stuff like 250 threaded rods uh, this, is, this starts eliminating a lot of waste. Uh, you heard Connor speaking about lean there, and there's also the course here in Sligo, this lean construction. It's all about eliminating waste, and using BIM and the technologies available now, you can really cut down on the waste. Uh, just an example of the visualization. So some tools for visualization are A360 and Navis Works. These are free softwares that you can view the models on, on your phone, tablet um, and also on your laptop. That's just an example of where this containment and the pipework and the supports all went in but with the, the floors and the ceilings are just hidden in this view just to give you an idea of what's happening. So you have the structural steel model there and all of the services supports in the area. Uh, another fantastic uh, thing with BIM is the clash detection and the clash avoidance. So the, by using BIM on this project, we actually ended up saving the structural engineers and the refrigeration contractors a lot of time and rework and money. And we didn't have to put in any effort to do that. We, it just automatically happened by building the model. It just gives you a far clearer picture about what's happening in the overall project. Uh, there were just two examples where the refrigeration pipework was going to clash with structural steel. And then the uh, extract ductwork that was coming up off the AHUs. Uh, in the structural model we had received from the structural contractor, there was no allowance made for from those to pass through. So this is something that probably would have went to site and all of a sudden we have no space to get out with these ducts. It would have been very expensive to do this on site. Whereas we were just able to send them a quick screenshot and say, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but you have a clash and their replies, Obviously, thanks very much. You're after saving us time and money. But we didn't have to go to any big effort. These problems just start presenting themselves when you start building them in a 3D world. 
uh, virtual reality as well. This is something that gives you an exact representation of what a project is going to look like. You put on the headset and you can walk through basically the finished building before the work even starts on it. It's, uh, I don't know if anyone here has tried it, it's very impressive. Uh, when, when the models are well advanced, we actually went to this client and let them have a walk through it and they can do things like say, put them in their office and say, well actually no, I want the television on this wall, which means you can relocate the sockets before you have to do it on site. You can walk them down through the production hall and they might spot something there much quicker and say, no, that line needs to move and again, saving, saving the problems before you hit them on site because they're much more expensive to work out on site. Uh, any comments that's made from after a virtual reality tour, they're captured and any, any further changes then they can be picked up on the model and you can issue out your construction drawings and your 3D model for everyone to work off on site. Uh, this is also when you hand over uh, a model, you can have it, the, all, all the elements that you have in this model, you can have them rich with information. So there's a little distribution board on the side of an AHU and there's these things called links. So you can be walking through the model, click on the link and it'll open up the test sheet with all the information on that. That's something we've stored locally in our test record location on SharePoint. So and our employees can go in, the King of Moffat email address, they can go in, flick on that and update it and say, well, then you know this was tested on this date. So it's live information all the time. So the outcome of deciding to use BIM on this project, the project was completed ahead of schedule. There was no rework required. There was no extra ordering of items and no waste or returns. Uh, typically at the end of a job, you have to send a lorry up to bring back all the waste. There was no waste on this project. Uh, client, uh, the client workshop was actually held with the board of directors and they asked us to take over the coordination on some of the future facilities that they're going to be building in New Zealand and Holland. They brought myself and two of the directors over and were discussing this. So it opened up a completely new business opportunity with this client. Uh, Off-site fabrication, so this was a recent level two BIM project and we find that the, it, it takes the dangerous work like Hotworks, you're bringing it away from the site, you have a huge saving on the installation time and the labour on site. Uh, Connor has, has this all covered in the, in the previous presentation but I'll just show an example of how we've been doing it recently. Um, we created a suitable hanger family for our cable containment. We've the cable ladder in blue, a cable tray in the grey colour. Uh, there's a two compartment enclosed tray is the red and then our data containment is in the purple. So we sat down and we said, how, co how can we design a suitable bracket where we can get this coming to site and save us some time? So this is a schedule out of Revit and each bracket, this is the information we were able to get out of it. The length of the rods either side, so the rods are the four threaded rods which are connecting onto the structural steel. The so it gives us the side where there's a difference in sizes between rod A and rod B, that's because there was a slope on the roof. Um, the, just the information, extend right means where there was an extension on the unistrut, that one on the left hand side there, it extends out past the rod to carry an extra tray and full full information to start building these containment modules, we'll call them off-site. So this was uh, two hours away from the actual building site in a facility where you, you could do much more controlled work and properly set up with all your cutting stations and you're taking it away from the construction site which can get very congested and it's generally much more dangerous and they also if you want to do any cutting and grind and stuff like that on site you have to look for permits all of this is time <clears throat> so the containment was fixed to these hangers and all of the hot works was carried out in a controlled environment the end caps were added to the hangers and the modules were delivered to site so after going up in a mup and connecting four threaded rods what the contractors or our site team were after doing is they're after putting up their threaded rods the hangers ladder, tray, basket, and uh, trunken. This was just done by connecting four G clamps. 
typically you might get a delivery of cable ladder, you go up to do the work, next thing the basket might be arriving in a different container. It's a very fragmented way of working. This way everything came together, end caps, everything was fitted. It was one trip up, connect the rods and come back down and put up the next one. This is how they were delivered to site. And this is what it looked like when it was connected. So we were able to use the structural steel model to see exactly where we had secondary steel, our purlins, where we hadn't really heavy loads like this. There was dedicated, with going into this level of detail, we were able to say to the main contractor, okay, we have this weight on the containment of this area, and they put in dedicated secondary steels for us. Uh, there was hundreds and hundreds of meters of containment installed in this facility and there was not one snag on the cable containment install which is pretty much unheard of compared to some of the other jobs we'd have been doing and it just far more consistency and quality so the time taken to install the containment was taken way down we got very positive feedback from the main contractor and the people on site doing the work uh, the hot works were eliminated and it just, it, it, it seemed to work very well and it's something we're going to be looking into in much more detail in, in the future. Um, the quality of the drawings that we're able to give to the site, so typically they would have got 2D plans and basically we're just found, we're much, it's much quicker once you've put the information into the model. If you were asked to do up sections for services, at every grid line using the 2D traditional way. You could spend weeks doing it. When you've built it in a model, this, this typically a drawing like this could, it could be done in 20 minutes. It automatically, you put a section in, it pulls it off and you drag it onto the sheet. And the text underneath of them just tells you what grid line or what area that this is happening with the dimensions down from the structural steels included. Uh, also in trickier areas, we also leave on the other models such as sprinkler, refrigeration, structural, just to see if something different is happening in an area that you can see, well, there's a reason why we're doing this. There's a sprinkler main there or there's a refrigeration main there. Um, again, this is just the quality of the drawings. You can include a 3D view, much easier for the people on site to see what's happening. Uh, the drawing on the right-hand side there, it's basically this was up on the first floor level over a ceiling. This was trunking for the lighting that was below the ceilings. And anywhere the, something was happening that wasn't the norm or the straight run, you just put a 3D view out on the side of the sheet and you can, the people can very easily see why, why it's different here than it was further down. Uh, I'm just quickly going to talk a bit about the laser scanning. Uh, Connor was talking about it earlier on. Basically, as he said, you can go into an area, a room like this, two minutes, you can do a full laser scan. This can be brought back, linked into the model, and all of a sudden you're coordinating with really the conditions that are on site, not guessing or not wondering if something is going to be in the way. Uh, this was a project out the, it was actually just a project out the Boyle Road in Carrick and Shannon. There was no BIM requirement on it. It was in the early days. We wanted to see what the scanning was and how has it worked. Uh, this was a, a job that we were doing up in the port, Dublin port. And we asked for drawings for the project and we were given that drawing on the left. That was generated by hand in 1976 and they wanted us to go in and start doing work in there. So we said, no way. Uh, so we said, went up, scanned it half a day, scanned the whole building came back and we built a model of it from the scan. So once you link in the scan, you, it's basically like tracing over it. Uh, built a full 3D model and we were able to position all of our containment, all of our lighting, distribution boards, uh, fire alarm spacings, everything was able to be done in the model. And on the right hand side, that's a render out of the model and on the left hand side is a photograph. The detail you can get is phenomenal. Uh, this is another example of laser scanning. If you're asked, we were asked to go back into a project that we had worked on two years previously. There had been other contractors and people in since, and they asked us to come back and do a design using the model that we had done earlier. We said, oh, there's been people in there since, so we can't verify it's going to work. Uh, went over to the UK, 
scanned it and we were able to link the scan in with what we had done in the past and coordinate a full route. There was no clashes, no rework, and no waste. So just another example of how you can use laser scanning. The laser scan is linked in on the right hand side there. You can just see where it's hitting off the ducts and everything that was installed. Uh, the robotic total stations. If you have went to the effort of building a full 3D model, uh, another way of getting great use out of it on site is using a robotic total station. You, you bring the total station into a room or an area, tell it where it is by setting it off a grid line or using coordinates. And on the left hand side, this, that tablet is actually a Windows 10 PC built into it. You can select a brake glass or a sounder or a socket and their total station flies around and points it out with a laser. So you have one person going into a room, setting out in less than half the time to far more accuracy. Again, when you come into a scenario where you might have a curved wall in a facility, very hard to measure that or mark that out. Uh, again, your total station sets that stuff out in half a second. Uh, I'm not sure how we're going for time on that, but... Hope you got some information out of it. Anyways, cheers. Thank you.